we are live. Welcome to Laser Beam Live, our bi weekly laser live stream where we will be going through tutorials, uh, answering questions, doing projects on a bi weekly basis, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are currently in the CNC Labs workshop in the back. And I just want to say welcome. If you're already here, we're going to give it a, just a couple minutes before we really start, uh, just to let people come in, uh, people who are late. But if you have any questions that you want to ask, if you have any comments, just throw them in the uh, in the live comments and we will check them out. We will read them. We will try to get as, to as many as possible. We can't promise that we'll get to them all, but we will try. So thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Ikeno Ofoha, and I might have to go through this intro a little bit later when people start coming in, but I'll try my best not to repeat myself too many times. Uh, if there's any issues with the audio, with the, if there's any issues with the stream, uh, we got very capable people in the background that will help me uh, power through to give you guys the best experience that we can during this uh, this little hour that you have with me today. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, if you just want to say hi, let me know what you're thinking in the in the in the live comments. And let me know, and we'll just start in a couple minutes. So yeah, I'm very excited to be doing this. I feel like oh sorry, I'm just reading a few. It's awesome to hear that some of you guys are starting to assemble the laser. Uh, we figured that having a more one-to-one -one kind of interaction with our customers will kind of cause better interaction with the product itself and just with the whole ecosystem of, of the uh, of the long mill and the laser beam. So I'm glad to hear that some of you guys. Uh... So somebody asked, uh, can you show how to laser over engraved image to give a 3D photograph look. So we can do that in another live stream. So that's a great idea for a different live stream. Uh, but yeah, this that's the type of stuff that we're gonna be doing every two weeks. We're gonna pick a project that people like, people recommend. Uh, we might start putting out polls and things like that to grab some ideas from you guys because we wanna make things that you guys want. We wanna do tutorials and show you stuff that will actually be useful to you. Uh, help you get the most out of your laser and the most out of your uh, your your long mill. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, a laser engraving over like milled things to give a more three D look. That's a that's a great project idea. I think we can make some cool stuff. So Grant says that the audio might be a little bit muddy. Hopefully that's not everybody uh we tried to uh, do a few test streams to make sure the audio was good but uh if it keeps uh if it keeps uh, a little bit muddy for you then we'll look into the audio we'll try to we'll try to clean it up a little bit more so performance gains to get max darkness for fast operation so if you are already running at um dip switch level five you have 100% power set on your light burn file and you're maxing out your long mill speed, then uh, you kind of hit the ceiling of the machine. Um, so pretty much when you're actually using the machine, you're kind of limited by two factors, speed and power. So they are inversely related. So when you raise speed, it looks like you have less power. You could be at 100%, but if you max out speed, you're going to have less power. And same thing. If you lower speed, it's going to look like you have more power. So that's kind of a trade-off that you have to make when you are you might be doing a project for a long time when you're looking for that really, really dark grain. And you might be able to speed things up if you're looking for a lighter look. So what is the best software for use for the long mill laser? It is Lightburn. Um, we, we don't like to kind of promote softwares unless we personally use them and we personally believe that they're the best. But that is why we sell the Lightburn license on cnc.com, the shop. You can check it out in the laser section. And that's why we sell it. During the entire testing process, uh, we used Lightburn because it was the easiest and the best. It just had the most intuitive functionality, had the most functionality, and had the greatest uh, community on the back end. You know, here at CNC, we pride ourselves on making a community because we have such great customers that are willing to help and willing to provide context and tutorials for people when we can't or when uh, when it just fits their schedule. So they kind of have the same vibe over there at Lightburn, and that's why we, we love using it. And yeah, 
Yeah, so we will be going into a little bit of the functionality of Lightburn and getting things kind of moving on Lightburn. I'll try to go through as many things I, as I can when using Lightburn so that you guys can kind of use that as an ease of use kind of tutorial. I have put out a video on uh, making a project using Inkscape to design to Lightburn to Gsender or UGS, I believe at the time. I think I showed both softwares. Scott has also made a great video in depth on how to use Lightburn and uh, the max power of the laser. Sorry, I just skipped over. But yeah, Scott has made a great video on how to actually use the laser. Uh, he's also made great videos on how to assemble the laser and how to get it uh, going, what to, when, what to plug into what, and all that good stuff. So if you need a one-to-one -one on how to sketch your laser to the point where you can use the software, then check out the three-part video series Scott used or Scott did. On the third part, he goes into software. I also have a video on software. And but today we will be using Lightburn to kind of show you some some functionality and some usability on Lightburn as well. Uh, what is the max power of the laser? So the max power of the laser is genuinely tested at seven watts of optical power. So a lot of uh, laser companies, um, they like to embellish their actual optimal power. So they might say it's a five watt laser and we've tested certain five watt lasers that end up actually outputting two watts of optical power. So some people might be seeing cheaper lasers with more power, but um, honestly, a lot of them are actually tested to be below their marketed power. We wanted to market the actual power. So seven watts of optical power, it's a lot right now uh, for the market. And we thought it was suitable for people just getting into lasers and all that stuff. Obviously, as you get uh, higher and higher power requirements, you start to look at things like uh, CO2 lasers and things like that, which obviously come with more of an expense. But we thought this was a great add-on to give another dimension to the stuff that you can do with the long mill. Uh, one second. Somebody asked, uh, is this recorded so that we can watch it again? I believe so. I think all of our live streams are recorded so that they they live on the YouTube channel forever and people can always reference it. Uh, if we get into some good pockets of information, we may even start cutting these up so that we can provide that in more short, bite-sized pieces of content for you guys. How do you line up the laser to your CNC? So uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. But uh, after you mount your laser, you have a certain offset. And obviously, you have the laser test function that can use kind of use as a line of function. Let's say you wanted to CNC something, and then you also wanted to laser it after. You would run your, your, your router job through G-Sender or whatever software you're using. And then you can use a light power setting to actually line up your laser to the start position and rerun the job with your laser code and actually have that. That's more... Uh, easy to follow way to do laser uh, jobs after engraving jobs with the router. But uh, that's definitely something that we will get into. Uh, I think somebody else mentioned how somebody else mentioned how will we actually, uh, if we were interested in actually doing projects that are router engraves and then a laser engrave to add a more 3D depth. That is something we're definitely interested in. And that's why we made this live show, uh, the Laser Beam live show, so that we can take ideas from you of what you want to see, uh, what type of help you need, what type of tutorials you need, what type of info you need. And then we can do this every two weeks with a new project and a new job to play with. Somebody asked, will you be selling higher watt lasers in the future? Um, I really do love uh, lasers. Uh, so if it was up to, uh, to me and how I see the future going is eventually just making more high power lasers to do more and more and more. I find that once you power up the laser box device and come back the next day, you have to reset in order for it to start up. So Jeremy, that's a good, uh, that's something that you notice, and that is the safety functionality of the laser. So developing the laser was actually very stressful beyond mechanical development, beyond electronic development, there was also uh, government regulation when it comes to laser. So our government, the Canadian government, uh, the US government, and even the International um, Electronics Committee, they all have different guidelines for what you can do with the laser and what sort of safety functions you need to have in a laser in order to even be able to sell it and, and feel good about that and even have the, the kind of legality there. So if you turn off your laser, 
and you the laser stops receiving power like you turn off a a um, if you unplug it if you turn off your uh, your power bar the laser will essentially take that as a power off fault and it will need you to reset the button reset the driver using the reset button why is this such so important is because if you are running a laser job and your power went out for some reason and you went to go flip on the um, uh, the fuses, let's say it was somewhere else uh, where your CNC is, and you went to go flip on the, the fuses, and you came back uh, when the power was on, your laser would already be running without the safety functions because there's no safety feature there. So you need it to shut off. So if it's not, if, if, if you turn it off by unplugging it, if you take out the key, if you take out the interlock button, if you, if you turn off the power uh, bar that you're uh, plugged in to, it will automatically need a reset. And this is just to keep everybody safe, to make sure that you're consciously using your device so that you never have to make a mistake, nobody ever gets hurt, and things of that nature. If you're running both G-Center and Lightburn on the same laptop, which app should be started first to prevent conflicts in the USB port acquisition? You should start G-Center, or technically you should start whichever software you're going to be using as your machine interface. So. We recommend G-Sender, it's a great software. Chris and the software engineering team worked very hard for a very long time to kind of keep improving it and they continuously improve it. So you wanna connect, it will connect to whichever one connects to it first, right? So Lightburn has a machine interface built in and G-Sender itself is a machine interface software. So whichever one you connect to, the, whichever one you start first and select for connection is gonna be the one it wants to connect to first. So if you're Opening up both, I would recommend opening up G-Sender first, connecting to that, and then opening up Lightburn so that it won't just jump and hop over to Lightburn connectivity. It'll stay on G-Sender or vice versa. So um, whichever one you're using as a machine interface, you want to open that up first, connect the long mail first, and then you can open up your design software like Lightburn uh, just to make sure there's no conflict of interest in the USB connection. Okay, so we have some awesome, we have an awesome amount of people here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Again, my name is Ikeno Foa. I developed the laser beam over the last year, um, and we've been shipping for about eight, nine months, and it has been a wild ride uh, to develop a product from scratch, uh, something that I personally wanted, and uh, I wanted to see in the market, something that was high quality, and that was easy for our current customers with a long mill to just uh, plug and play. So that's kind of where we were. We didn't want to mess around with extra wiring, adding a resistor, things like that. We wanted something that, was, that worked, that was high quality, and that we could provide service with when you have a ticket or when you send in, uh, when you call in for with an issue. And I've tried my very best uh, to kind of do that on a daily basis. So if you've ever sent in a ticket with the words laser in it, it gets sent directly to me, and I almost always answer personally. Uh, we usually hop on calls, we do the replacements, all that stuff. Um, so Jeremy asked, can you engrave a, and laser in Lightburn? Yes, you can. So you can use Lightburn as a machine interface. It's a very simple machine in interface. So if you ever used UGS or Universal G-Code Center, it's very similar to that where you don't have too many features, but you have enough to kind of run your job through Lightburn. Um, what do you recommend for testing materials? How to push the speeds and feeds and amps of the laser? So. If you are set if on the on the driver, if you have it set to dip switch five, so uh, you have five dip switches, the blue dip switch that mechanically limits power. So you have something on the on the actual hardware side that will limit power. Uh, when you set it to five, you're allowing the driver to have five amps, which is the maximum amperage for the diode that we use, seven watts, that will get you to 100 percent. So then you can obviously go into Lightburn and your de design software and limit that via percentages, but Having dip switch five in the downwards position, downwards is off, is on. Just remember that downwards is on. Call it a dip switch. So you got to dip the one that you want. Only ever use one dip switch at a time. Uh, that's going to be maxing out your power. Again, you can lower speed at, to get a more uh, more power down to your material, right? So inversely related, you lower speed. It's going to look like your laser is more powerful than if you raise speed at the same power level. Uh, any recommendations for a bed, simply use a spoil board. 
use wood, use honeycomb. So me personally, I like to have a extra piece of MDF. Obviously, with the laser test setup, uh, we just laser right onto the MDF because this is a machine specifically for lasers. So I don't mind marking up the uh, MDF wasteboard. For simplicity, you can cut out a wasteboard that slides in to your current wasteboard. Uh, that's a little bit shorter than the feet on your long mill. And because there's minimal, you don't really have to do work holding. Or if you do, you're really just, you're, you're able to use very light stuff like a hot glue or something like that. Usually I don't use weight, uh, any work holding. So you can actually just slide a piece of MDF on that you don't mind marking up. You can even uh, laser a grid onto it so you have some sort of thing to reference. And then you can just slide it off when you're done, right? So that's the easiest way. Um, in the future, we might look at different things and offering maybe a mat situation, maybe recommending different products that you can use. But for me, that's just the easiest. I like the simplest way. And then as people get more experience, they will eventually do a little bit more research and will offer a little bit more resources into different types of uh, kind of waste board using. Will the laser have an air assist? So the laser actually does have an air assist. So myself and another engineer at the company, we designed this uh, to be kind of simple, to be 3D printed and laser cut in house. Um, that has a radio fan, 12 volt radio fan, feeding to an articulating nozzle that you can slide onto the heat sink of your actual laser. So if you've gotten a laser beam, uh, it actually comes pre-installed. And then you have this, so you can loosen it and tighten it. So you can loosen it, slide it off and tighten it and uh, have it stay in place. You can also loosen and tighten the nozzle so you have uh, some articulation. And so what you really want to use air assist for is for cutting. So it moves and shifts the debris off your board and it clears essentially a uh, space for the laser so it can hit your material uninstructed or uh, unobstructed. So that's what it's made for. So if you're engraving, it might give a weird effect where it blows ash when you're engraving. But what it does is it gives you deeper cuts because there's less smoke, there's less particulate in the way of the actual laser when it's cutting, right? Yeah, so thank you, Ethan. So Ethan's a perfect example of somebody who sent in a ticket about um, not being able to use or wanting to use Lightburn as an actual machine interface. He needed some help, and we just booked some time. He downloaded TeamViewer, and uh, we just I just hopped over, uh, remoted into his computer, and we went over on the phone on how to set it up, and we made sure it was working uh, to make sure that he could use Lightburn as his machine interface. Um, so what are the different lenses for? So we have four different lenses. Um, the G2 is a good cutting lens, right? Because it has the shortest focus length. It does have the um, largest beam, but it has the best efficiency. So that seven watts, the most amount of power is gonna get through the G2 and actually get to your material. So the three element has the three element lens has the smallest beam size, right? So you're gonna get the tightest beam size. So if I wanted to do super, super thin lines, super thin and detailed engraving, I might switch over to the three element lens. It has a wider um, focus length, right? But it has a tighter beam, so it's gonna be a smaller focus point. So things are gonna be a little bit more detailed, but it has the worst efficiency, right? So I wouldn't use a three element if I wanted maximum power, but I would use it if I wanted maximum detail. And then G7 and G8 are very similar lenses where they're a good mix of that power and detail. Right, so that's kind of why we offer the uh, the different lenses, and that's why we're showing you how to use this um, download and use this Lightburn test file today. Because once you have this test file, you can change all the different variables, run this test file on different uh, materials at different settings, different speeds, different everything, and you'll have a recorded kind of uh, list of what you actually used. So this is actually one. Um, that we did here. So this is a good example. Maybe I'll try to get it closer, but this is what we're gonna be working on today, where it goes through text, lines, a cutting functions, and then you can change the text so that you can actually uh, have a reference point for when you're doing different projects, right? So that's what we're gonna be going to today. So even on dip switch one, at the lowest setting, in G-Center, laser burns the material when trying to focus the lens. Any tricks for lowering power settings for focusing? So that's a perfect segue into the first section of this laser beam live stream, 
we are going to be talking about focusing tips and tricks. So let's go through. Let me just talk about a few things and then maybe I can show you a few things and then we can get started with the actual test file and you can, you can kind of see my workflow and see how we get there. So tip number one, it's going to be using a material on top of your actual work material. So let's say I'm making coasters. I don't want the focus, uh, the focusing to leave a mark. I will grab a waste material. I will measure it. So I know this is 6.2 millimeters. So I know the thickness. I will put it on top of my work material. And then I will focus on there. So I will make sure that the focus height is set to that um, test material. So I have my work material. I have the focusing material on top of it. And then I will focus on to the focusing material in terms of height. I will get it, I'll twist the lens, get it to where I need the, the beam to be the smallest point. That's how you know you're in focus. And then I will focus it using G Sender uh, on whatever dip switch I need. And then after that, I will remove that test material that has the mark from focusing. And I will go into G Sender. So I'll show you guys really quickly what I would do. So and then I would just raise it, right? So or I would lower it by this. So the Z move function here, you can set that to six. And then I would just drop that down, right? So I focused it six millimeters higher than my actual material. Once I focused it on my actual test material, I remove it. And then I drop that using G Sender by the, the thickness of that test material. So in my case, it's six millimeters. And then I drop that down so I know it's in focus. So I don't need to turn it on on my actual work material. I know that it's not going to leave a mark. It's already tested. It's already in focus. And then I'm good to go. So hopefully that makes sense. So this trick is a little bit more for the more experienced. So in firmware, you have dollar sign 30. So in most cases, we want this to match our S value in Lightburn. So I'll just show you really quickly here in device settings we want it to match this s value max there's even a helpful note that says please match it to dollar sign 30 in gerbil to make sure you have 100 percent power capability so i will match this but let's say no matter what i do i don't want to use the test material method i just want to i just want to um, focus it on the actual material and not have it leave a mark what you can try is you can actually try to raise this number higher so what it's doing is it's taking your s value so that's set to 255 and right now dollar sign 30 is set to 255 but if i was to set this to 2000 right and i apply the new settings to make sure it saves and we can do some testing right now so let's switch over the camera view to show both of us so like that. So it might be it might get a little bit harder to hear because I'm going to turn on the driver fan. But uh, I, I want to show you guys in real time what we're talking about. So this is my focus material that's sitting on top of my actual material I'm going to be using. I'm going to switch this to dip switch five, right? So that's the most powerful setting that we have on the laser. The dip switch is set down to five. I'm then going to switch here. So I'm going to show you guys my screen here. And you can see that the laser on testing function. And guys, if you're having trouble with the laser testing function, uh, sometimes it might disappear. It might look like it's glitching. Just go to settings, go to spindle and laser, and make sure your toggle is on here for laser. And that should solve the problem. Let's say this is disappearing or you're not able to actually use this and some funny things are happening. Uh, that's how you're going to fix that. Let's say I set it to a low percentage. Let's say 2%. So, it, Ethan, thanks for asking your question. So the, so the actual material that we're going to be doing the test file on is actually 3 millimeters. But my focusing material that I'm going to mark up so that I don't actually mark up my real material is 6 millimeters. So it's good to know that so that we can switch it. So Jeremy's asking, what are the macros? So I'll quickly go through that before I turn the laser on and we do some focusing. Uh, what are the macro settings for the laser? Example, dollar sign 30 equals what? Dollar sign 31 equals what? Dollar sign 32 equals what? So let me run you through that. 
So dollar sign 30 should always match the S value in your design software. So in Lightburn, uh, because of the 8-bit software, and we want to set it to 255, but essentially, as long as this value, S value max, matches your dollar sign 30 function, you will have 100% availability on your software side, right? Uh, if you read the, the little helpful note that Lightburn leaves there, the maximum spindle speed value Lightburn will output uh, corresponding to 100% power, this much this must match your dollar sign 30 setting in Gerbil. So exactly what I said. Whatever this is, it could be a thousand, it could be a hundred. Numerically and software-wise, the best value to use to have the cleanest numbers is 255, right? That's why we always recommend setting it to 255. But you could set it to a hundred, a thousand, as long as it matches your dollar sign 30 function, right? Because if you divide Let's say I set my S value max to 100, but I set my dollar sign 30 to 1,000. I'm only going to have maximum 10% of the max power of the laser on the software side. It will not, it will not let me go past 10%. If I have S value max at 100 and I have dollar sign 30 at 100, it will have 100% of the power, right? So that's how you kind of do that. So let's say it's your, your laser is too powerful. Even at dip switch one, at 1% 1 power, it's still marking up your material. You don't want to use the test material method of putting a material on top of your actual work material and then focusing it on that, making sure it's at the right height, make sure it's at the right focus. And then once you remove that, you drop it down by the thickness of that, uh, that test material that you were using. Let's say you don't want to use that function. You could raise this significantly higher than what your s value max is so right now our s value max is 255 and this is going to be changed to 2000 right so we apply that settings we can double check to make sure those settings saved so it's 2000 right now we are only going to have a little over 10 percent of the maximum power here and now we set this power in the test uh, section here to two percent if i turn this laser on it's going to be we can see that the laser is so low that it still might burn, right? So obviously, always wear your glasses. Make sure everybody in the studio is wearing their glasses. And I'm going to switch this to dip switch setting number one. Let's turn that on. And as we can see, we're not really burning our material here. It might be hard to see in the video, but we're not actually burning our material here. And that's because we're so low in terms of our settings here. So I'm going to turn the laser off. So that's another way you can kind of play with the settings of your laser is setting your, your S value max to whatever you need it to be. 100, 255, whatever feels more natural. But in your firmware settings, you can set this higher um, so that you're only, you only have so much power available. So let's, let's see what happens if we change this to 20,000, right? Let's apply those new settings. I'm just gonna double check, make sure the settings saved. Oh, so we want 20,000. There we go. So let's triple check, make sure we're at the right setting. So right now our, our, our dollar sign 30 is at 20,000 and our S values at 255. So we should only have access to a percentage of the power and we switch this. Uh, Nicholas, I would recommend that you turn off your laser when you're switching dip switch settings. So although you, on, on the surface level, it won't be an issue. When you flip it up, your laser will just turn off. And then when you flip the new switch down, your laser will turn back on. But I always just recommend, whenever you're changing anything like that, I would just re recommend turning it off and then switching the value and then turning it back on, just for general electronic safety. Um, so glasses are gonna be back on. 
and I'm going to turn the laser back on. And I, and I just 10 x our, our dollar sign 30 value in comparison to our S value. And I'm going to turn it back on. As you can see, we're at such a low power setting, right? And you might not be able to see, but we're not actually burning our material, right? So you can see where the laser's sitting. I'll let it sit there for a bit. And then you can see we're not actually burning our, uh, our material, right? So again, you can see sitting right in the middle. Let's say I wanted to line up my project. Let's say I wanted to make sure that where my laser is going to be firing. And we're not burning our material there, right? So that's another, that's another little hack that you can use. But me personally, I like to use just putting the, the focus material on top of our actual use material, knowing that this is six millimeters, focusing it onto that. So making sure our, our focus height is set right now. And we're focusing it in terms of twisting the lens. And then once we're ready to start our project, we just remove our material. And in G Sender, all we do is drop that down, right? So we make our Z move six millimeters. So whatever the thickness is of our of the material on top of our actual material. And then we just go Z down by six, right? That's going to get us there. That's going to get us where we need to be. Our material is clean and we're ready to use the laser, right? So that's another, fo that's another focusing tip. Can you use sunglasses or you have... So Ethan, uh, you have to use the laser glasses. So the 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 power that the laser produces, it's in a blue light spectrum. So it's about 450 nanometers to about 475 nanometers. It is so dangerous to your eyes, uh, just the raw light, if you don't have these safety glasses. These are special safety glasses with an optical density rating of seven plus. So they're very high, they're very expensive in terms of how, how much they cost to get. And uh, they will damage your eyes very, very quickly. Um, you'll start to see black spots in your eyes if you're staring at the laser for too long without these glasses. So uh, always wear the glasses. Anybody else who's in your shop, who's uh, walking around the laser, who's gonna be around, you should also get some glasses for them as well, or just have them stand uh, behind the laser. Maybe you can section off a part of your shop so that they know um, to stand behind it so that they're not viewing the laser at all. Uh, the light can bounce off surfaces and also damage your eyes. So it's always best to just wear your safety glasses. I did design them or I did uh, have the frames uh, made large enough so that you can fit them over your regular glasses. So as you can see, uh, I'm wearing pretty large glasses here, uh, pretty wide and, and large glasses. And these have no problem just fitting over them and they're pretty comfortable. So always wear the safety glasses. That's my recommendation. Always wear the safety glasses. They're not just regular glasses. Uh, they're they're made for the exact um, wavelength of this laser, and they are optically dense enough to protect your eyes from the amount of power uh, that they're coming up. Will the will the blue light spectrum hurt the lenses of a camera or the viewers? It will not hurt the viewers, and it will not hurt the camera. So, well, I can't say not because, uh, because you never know, but it's almost like uh, if you stare at the sun long enough, your eyes will get damaged. But you can point your camera at the sun for however long you want, and your camera won't get damaged. It's not a, a, a guarantee on all cameras. I don't know the specs of all cameras, but we haven't had an issue with any of our cameras uh, whether it's your iPhone or whether it's like any of our, our more uh, professional cameras, but you are safe to look at the screen. Um, the intensity is not going to transfer over through the actual screen. Your screen itself has a limit to how intense uh, the color can be uh, shown, right? So that is actually just a great question. Might be, I was actually kind of curious about that in the beginning. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be all right for the camera. It's going to be all right for the viewer. You're totally fine. Just when you're in the shop working with the laser, always have the safety laser glasses on. It's not worth it. It is so fun to work on this stuff. Um, so it's so fun to work on this kind of stuff, but it's never worth your safety. 
Okay, and I know you guys know that, so just to put that out there. So somebody asked, what should dollar sign 31 and what should dollar sign 32 be set at? So dollar sign 31 and dollar sign 32. So let's go to firmware. So dollar sign 31 should always be set to zero. So you can think of dollar sign 31, and I'm going to set dollar sign 30. Think of your minimal maximum uh, minimal minimum spindle speed as the lowest value to shut off your laser, right? And we want that to be zero because let's say it was set to one, your laser would actually not be able to turn off when it's running code. It would only know on and on, right? Because if it's set to one, that means your your controller is sending driver a PWM signal. That's how the long mill driver communicates with the with the actual laser driver and it'll always send a little signal telling it to be on even if your code is telling the laser to turn off during the white spaces in your code or between lines in your code it's supposed to be off if you set this to anything other than zero dollar sign 31 if you set this to anything other than zero it will always be on there'll always be a, a stagnant signal to not letting it turn off so always set that to zero and dollar sign 32 should be set to one or so yeah so if you're using the laser this is essentially enabling laser mode um, so you set that to one obviously the awesome software designers and chris our cto they made it just an easy toggle for you guys so you guys can just toggle it so you don't have to actually set any numbers for it because it's more intuitive because it's either on in terms of laser mode is disabled or it's off if in terms of laser mode is disabled or on in terms of laser mode is enabled. So if you're using UGS or in Lightburn when you just have a console and you have text, then yes, you would do dollar sign $32 equals one to enable laser mode. You want dollar sign thirty one to equal zero, and you want dollar sign thirty, in the best case scenario, to equal two fifty five. But you want it to equal whatever your S value in your design software is. So in Lightburn, we set that to two fifty five. But if you want us to set that to a hundred, you just make sure on G Sender that it's set to a hundred. So just make sure those two values are matched. Dollar sign thirty always matches S value max uh, in your design software. In terms of Lightburn. That's where you can find it, where I just showed you. So, Jills, I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. My laser hasn't arrived yet. Do the glasses come with the laser or do you have to buy them separately? So, again, this goes back to the um, government regulations. You, We can't sell the laser without uh, including the, the safety equipment stock so every laser beam will have the the safety glasses one pair of safety glasses stock so that you as the user are protected we went a little bit above and beyond so that even when you're using your air assist this um this acrylic is the same um shade as this and we had it tested in our shop so that it's also offering you extra protection in terms of that beam that does not mean that as long as you have the air assist on that you don't have to wear the glasses because these glasses are have a higher optical density level than the actual acrylic on the uh on the air assist but it just adds to the protection right so don't use it as a replacement but it was added protection so yeah your your laser beam will come with g2 lens like kelsey in the chat thank you kelsey you are much appreciated uh it will come with a, a g2 lens stock it will come with the glasses stock it will come with the air assist stock so all these things are stock when you order them you don't have to order thing, anything extra but let's say you like you have a partner in your shop most of the time or uh, somebody who you live with likes to just walk in and out of your shop while you're doing jobs you might want to order an extra pair and just let them know that the laser is in use so that if they want to walk into the shop um, you just you just have them to put on the glasses uh, as you should be wearing as well So Nicholas, uh, when you're lowering the power setting, you can unfocus the lens a little bit, right? There's going to be a sweet spot, right? So just for when the focusing, it's really hard to show you on the camera, right? But when you're focusing, um, you want to actually, you're going to see a rectangle when your laser is, when your lens is very out of focus. Then you're going to see a smaller circle. 
when you're when you're starting to become focused but when you're actually focused you're going to see a pin drop the light is going to uh is going to be like a pin drop and it's going to be very intense so if you just wanted to line up your laser you didn't want to focus it but let's say you wanted to line up the starting point you can obviously go dip switch level one which is going to be 20 percent of the maximum power you're limiting on the hardware side and then you can go one or two percent on g sender here you can go one to two percent on the test function here so you're limiting as much power as you can during the focus and then you can twist your your lens to a point where it forms a circle but you're not in focus so that you can use to line things up so let's say you're you're doing a center point design right it's a, maybe you're doing a coaster it's circle you want to start at the center point draw your center point you know where your center point is uh, on your material but then you line up the laser using an unfocused laser right to get the general starting point so that you can start you can also do outline tests, right? You can also use the outline function to actually get your outline without actually uh, burning your material to make sure that you're gonna start where you need to start. So thank you so much for all the questions. We really appreciate that. But now let's get to the nitty gritty of what we wanted to show here. And let's get into the laser test file. So this file you can find, we linked to the resource section in the description. So it is under the thank you eric for the question or for the statement yes uh it's very intuitive right so for me i would recommend spending some time just uh testing focus right so testing focus will mean turning the laser on burning a scrap material right and seeing how tight you can get the laser beam right so a good way to know if you're focused is that when you twist it and you, you think it's focused, you're like, oh, this must be the smallest size. If you're right, if you twist it just a little bit more, the beam's going to become bigger again. So it starts big. You twist it into focus. It becomes really small. And if you're not sure if you're in focus, twist it a little extra. And if you're, if you're in focus, it'll immediately become big again right so it goes big small and it becomes big again so if you're in focus you want to know if you're in focus twist it a little bit extra and if it starts to become big you can dial it back to where you were because you know that was the focus so big small you're not sure okay go a little bit farther oh it's becoming big again okay dial it back to where it was so uh why is the speed 25.4 millimeters so this is just uh, one inch per second. So this is the, the conversion for one inch per second. We are a Canadian company. We are proud Canadians. Uh, so we are using the metric system. For you guys, you guys can do the conversion. So if you guys wanna do the conversion for my speeds and feeds and the recommended speeds and feeds and the resources, you can. Uh, or you can always, um, in Lightburn, you can go to general Lightburn settings, the gear. And you can switch to inches, millimeters. But if you're taking our recommendations that are on the resources, just do the conversions from millimeters to to inches so that you're you're in the right settings, right? So I want to go through the material guide. So if you go to the resources, we link to this page. But if you go to the resources, the laser resources, and go to software section we have this uh, light burn file for you to download. So, so Josh, in terms of testing faster speeds, the maximum speed of the long mill itself, the, the hardware is actually limited, is going to be, I believe, about 66 uh, millimeters per second, right? So 66 millimeters per second, or I believe it's 4,000 millimeters per minute, is the maximum that the, the long mill can actually move. So you're limited by that. But if you want darker designs, you want to lower the speeds, right? If you want lighter designs, you can raise the speeds. Hey, Gordon, uh, thanks for joining us. We are using a diode laser. So diode lasers are for lower power laser systems. Uh, CO2 lasers go up to hundreds, 150 watt of power. That's the really professional, really um, 
more for mass production. We do have a CO2 laser in the shop we use for cutting things out like acrylic for things like the uh, long mill controller, like the air assist. Um, it is a diode laser, thanks Nicholas, um, and it has seven watts of optical power, true tested optical power. Does the air assist have the correct distance from surface when it's set at the very top, uh, close to the surface? I ask because I do not recall getting the measurement totals tool for lens to surface. So if you didn't get the measuring tools for the lens, this is what they look like. You should get four. They're all labeled. Uh, this one is a G8 one. And uh, today we'll be using the G2 lens. You should have got all four stock with your laser. So if you didn't get that, uh, send us in a technical help ticket, uh, missing parts, and it'll go straight to me. And I'll make sure we get that sent out ASAP. So you should have got one of these for all four lenses whether you ordered all four lenses or not we wanted to give them stock just so in the future if you end up ordering the lenses you already have the focus finders ready to go so let's spend a little bit time on the actual lightburn file here so material test card so this is going to be a general um, for testing and we have we just posted in the chat so if you want to download it and check it out uh, you can so right here, you can change this to whatever test material you need. So three millimeter birch is the material that we're gonna be using today. So three millimeter birch, that's the material that we're using today. Um, and you can label it, right? So the whole point of this file is for, let's say you have a project. You're making a, a sign for somebody. You know that it's gonna be maple. And you want to make sure that your all your settings, the lens that you're using is going to be amazing. So what you can do one afternoon that you're bored and you want to test things out, you want to play with focus and all that, you just want to get things down, you have some free time, is you can take this file that we have posted here, you can change the name. So let's say it's six millimeter maple. So I would change this to six millimeter maple. Let's say you're using the G2 lens. Well, then you can you have the G you can label the lens. You're obviously using the seven watt diode that comes stock. And then you can choose what dip switch you want to test. So let's say you're using dip switch four, which we'll be using today, or you can use three, two, one, or five. So you can actually label that. You can put how many engraved passes you want. Um, you can put how many cut passes you want, how many Z step downs when you're doing cut. We will get back to that and I'll show you how to do that. Then you can put in your, what your engraved speeds are for the lines and fill for the images. This is all just using text. So when you download this file, you can. You can either edit the text or you can just delete this and add more text by clicking the A button to the left and then just placing it and then writing in your own text. So if you want to play with your own settings, if you want to change it from millimeters here to inches, if you're using inches, uh, then you can do that. So Josh, uh, we just posted in the chat how to get this file. We just uploaded it to the laser resources in software. Uh, under software is going to be the laser test uh, light burn file. So you can download this exact file. So all this text you can edit. So if you're changing the lens, you can get rid of G2 and add whatever lens. So three element, G7, G8, uh, all that stuff. For your cut settings, you just match whatever settings you want to test. So let's, uh, again, our example was six millimeter maple. So uh, then we have image testing. So in terms of your imaging, uh, you can, we had the image shading from zero to 100%. So you can see what that's looking like. This is going to be an image. Everything around it is text. This is also another image so that you can play with your image settings. So for this, it's Jarvis and it's 254 DPI in terms of your detail. So you can change that and test different things. And then you'll actually have the material to refer back to in terms of how things are going to look, how text is going to look, how the engraving is going to look, what the speeds look like, what the dip switch setting you used looked like, how many engraving passes and what it looked like, what lens and how what it looked like. Um, so uh, Jeremy asked, I tried a test piece of 2 by 10 by 12, and the grain burns much lighter than the wood in between the grain. Any suggestion? So that's just going to be the nature of engraving on wood. The grain is going to, is going to, change the color of which uh, your engraving looks. And if you can, we suggest, if you want a very seamless design, we suggest finding something that has um, 
the least amount of grain uh, the grain pattern in your wood so you're going to want to get a cut that has the least amount of that or engrave in a section that's the most homogenous in terms of grain color right but it, it, you just never know with wood your your top layer could be uh very homogenous it's all the same color but your second layer there could be parts that are darker for me i kind of like that effect i think it's cool i think it shows off the the grains of the wood but if you don't like that effect it's just going to be about uh finding a cut of wood that has the least amount of that as possible right but that's just the nature of wood and cutting with wood it's the same thing if you're if you're uh using a router and you're uh cutting into it or you're engraving into it with a router bit uh you're gonna find out what the grains of your wood look like at the certain depth that you're you're cutting and you're engraving into so that's just the nature of the beast with wood um so yeah just the bottom of this file you have the text so i have one super small font so you can kind of get a reference point for that and you have one the super large font but you can change the font size and light burn you can change the font type uh, and you can just test out different font and then last you have these the cut uh those little cut boxes so you can actually test the cutting function so we can check the settings here i have four passes for cutting at one millimeter step down for each z step and i have my settings at 100 percent at 2.2 millimeters per second and that just comes from the settings here so 2.2 millimeters per second you have four passes right if this is grayed out and you don't have access to this it's because your z-axis is not enabled in the settings so you want to go to the wrench and the screwdriver icon at the top go to device settings and you want to enable z-axis in z-axis control then when you go to your cut functions this will no longer be grayed out and you'll be able to actually do multiple passes of your z and you'll be able to do step downs that's what's going to become available so here we have z step per pass so if we have four passes it's going to step down one millimeter each time why because when you cut out when you cut out material, the laser is no longer on like uh, firing on top of the material. It's firing at the new point one millimeter down, right? Even if you had no Z step down. And after so many steps or after so many passes, your laser will eventually be a certain amount out of focus, right? So that's why we have the Z step down. So it'll do a pass and it's in focus, but then now the material is lower because you just cut that material. So now the machine will actually step down the exact distance that you set here. So my recommendation is if you're using the Z step down, you're going to want to take your thickness of your material and divide that by how many passes you're going to do. So mine does not follow that rule, but do as I say, not as I'm doing right now. I have a ton of experience with the laser, obviously. So I'm just going to play around with four passes at one millimeter. It'll be totally fine. Uh, but for you, you, if you want to be super accurate, take the thickness of your material. So for this three millimeter bolt uh, birch, I would divide that by four because that's the number of passes. And that's how much each step down would be realigning the laser and focus on each pass. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, some other things I wanted to talk about when it comes to this is that if you're using the air assist on your laser and you're using the z step down make sure that the clearance from the bottom of your air assist has enough for your step down so if you're stepping down four times one millimeter each make sure that the bottom of your air assist and the uh, material has more than four millimeters of space or else you'll end up crashing your air assist into your material so then you don't want that so that's another disclaimer for that so cuts there all these functionality in light burn so when you initially download Lightburn, you're going to have to make a device, right? So for the long mill, let's say you, you create manually. So where did I click? You click devices. So let's say my long mill was not connected and I needed to set my long mill into Lightburn for the first time. I would create manually. I would click Gerbil, G-R-B-L, not the other Gerbils. There's other uh, functions labeled Gerbil, but I just want Gerbil, nothing after it, right? That's going to be the most updated one. I'm going to click serial slash USB, and then I can label my machine. So I already have a, a long mill labeled, so I'll do 12 by 30 long mill uh, V2. I can then 
add the dimensions of my cut area and that will make uh, your design size the same size as your actual work material. So for 12 by 30, I'm going to go approximate. It's approximately around 750 by 750 millimeters by about 300. You can get the exact measurements of each of your different sizes of long mills on the long mill website or the resource section. We provide that info and then you can input it there. Uh, you click next. You choose which you know, what you want your origin to be. So I always choose front left uh, or essentially bottom left. Uh, if you're looking from uh, across your long mill, bottom left is going to be my home. I don't want to auto home and uh, I just want to finish. So now we can see here in devices, I have long mill V2, which is pretty much identical to what I made here, long mill, uh, 12 by 30 long mill. So you click that as your devices. So that's here under here, this drop down. So guys, um, so let me finish this up and then I'll ask, I'll answer the question that uh, Nicholas has, because I think it's a good question to have. Um, so you have 12 by 30 millimeter or 12 by 30 long mill and you just select the one that you made you make sure the com port is selected that is accurate if you wanted to connect it if you didn't then you just select the long mill it doesn't matter the com port it will size your work area to the size of your long mill this is the approximate size for 12 by 30 uh, and then you can go go ahead and do your design work right so now we can go into the settings so we have lines we have fill we have images and then we have a cut line. So just the basics, you have all these colors at the bottom. You have zero one or zero zero, zero one, zero two, zero three, and they're all different colors. Each color can denote a different functionality of your design, right? So all my text is black because I want it to uh, engrave at a certain, at the same power setting, right? So I set it all to the same color. My cutting is red because I can change the functionality of that and have it be different than the red. You can use all these colors to have all different sorts of, of, of uh, options, right? If you want a certain text to be darker, make it a different color, make it a different power setting, make it a different speed, set that. If you want a different set of text under it to be lighter, you can make it a different color, and then you can make a whole setting, uh, you can change the settings for that, and it won't affect the first line or the first color that you use for the other text. So you can have so many different arrays of uh, settings and different outputs from the actual control. This is one of the reasons why we love Lightburn. So you can see that everything here matches what we're gonna be using in our actual, in the hardware, in terms of laser, lens, um, dip switch setting, uh, and all these settings match all the settings here, right? So you remember I said Jarvising and 254 DPI for the image test, right? So when I click on my image, or when I click on my image settings here, we could see that the image mode is in Jarvis and our line intervals ha is 254 DPI. So if I wanted to test what other settings like this would look like or what these would look like, I can change that in settings and then I can change the text here, right? And label that accordingly so that the next time I look at my, at that, that test material, I could be like, oh, Jarvising at 254 DPI at this power setting looked amazing on Birch. So next time when I'm doing coasters on Birch, I'm going to use this, right? So question, I put 800, okay. First, I'm gonna answer Nicholas's question. Is the 12 volt accessory fan air assist, 12 volt port on the laser control always on, not controlled by light burn and G-code? Yes, the, the air assist is not controlled by your air assist function in here. So under every color setting, other, under every different setting you have for the different functionalities of lines, fill, cuts, all that images, you're gonna have this air assist function, just turn it off. Some laser systems have a built-in software uh, software aspect of their air assist that'll allow you to control it here. Uh, CO2 lasers also have that, um, but our laser uh, air assist is manual. So if you want the air assist, you just have to plug it in into the driver. You can check out the resources if you're unsure which output is made for the 12 volt air assist. Um, you will need to manually plug that in in order to actually turn the air assist on. So as soon as you plug it in, 
it will provide power to the air assist. If you don't want it on, to unplug it and remove it from your laser. Uh, so Stefan, Steven, Stefan, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, question, I put 800 by 800 for my long mill, but now I find it frustrating to move around on the grid. Is there a way to put scroll bars for the work surface, for the work surface? I'm a bit unsure what you're asking. So you put 800 by 800, and now it's frustrating. Um, in terms, are you talking about the design aspect of it? Or are you talking about the um, the physical scrolling around in terms of uh, jogging your machine? Uh, because you should be able, wherever the mouse header is, you should be able to scroll with the scroll wheel on your mouse, and that's where it'll zoom in, right? So if you're having trouble with the actual design aspect of it because the area is so large, you can always just, uh, yeah, so wherever your mouse is, just scroll with your mouse uh, scroll wheel, and it'll zoom in there, right? So if I want to zoom in on this top uh, right corner, I just put my mouse there, and I scroll with the scroll wheel. So if you if you if you want to drag around the hand, you click in your uh, your mouse scroll wheel. So a lot of mouses will have have a clicking function in it and you can click and then drag. So your scroll wheel is going to help you when you're maneuvering a large workspace here. So if I want to go to this top left corner, I put my mouse there and I scroll in. But let's say I want to move around manually. I click into my mouse scroll wheel and I drag drag downwards, drag downwards, and I'll move around the space. But let's say that's not fast enough, then I'll just scroll out. I'll point my mouse where uh, where I need to be, and I'll just scroll in with the scroll wheel. Uh, I need to be in this corner, scroll out, point it, scroll this corner, point it, scroll back to my design, point it, scroll. Easy peasy. Awesome. So back to this uh, design. I hope this is kind of self-evident. Uh, you can change the text. You can have different. You can run the same file on different materials. You can change all sorts of things, and you'll have a great reference point for everything. I let's say you forgot how the three-element lens looks on Maple at dip switch setting number five with a certain setting and certain imaging uh, processing technique you have that reference from the last time you did it and you can make minute changes, make more references, and you can build a whole library of these references so that you'll never wonder what one setting lens image is ever gonna look like on a certain material, right? So now let's get into actually running this job. So I'm going to save this G code. So again, we put the link in the comments, we put the link in the, in the description, it's in our laser resources section. You can go to the link and you can download this exact Lightburn software or this exact Lightburn file and you can change up anything. Any of this text you can change. You can even use it as a reference to make your own test file. But it's going to be great for reference. Um, so in order to download the G code, we're going. To, oh, actually, somebody asked how we would run this on uh, Lightburn. I'm going to give you a quick tutorial. Maybe I'll come back to this later as well. But if you don't have console here, right? So where it says cut and layers, you'll have these all these certain uh, tabs and you should have console here, right? So that's the console. It's actively looking for your USB port uh, for your long mill controller, but because it's already connected to G-Sender, Lightburn will never be able to connect to it. So you just, if you can't find it, then you go to window and you can enable all sorts of the, the windows and tabs here. So if, it, if you can't find it, then go to window at the top here and find console and enable it. And then it should show up here. And then you, sh you should be able to connect, you know, get to the right COM port here. Uh, make sure that G-Sender has already not, con has already, um, hasn't connected to it yet. And then you just click on console, right? So window, once you connect it to it, you're going to enable another, uh, functionality or window called move. So now that moves here, you have this very simple, basic way of moving and jogging your machine and setting the origin point, changing the distance that each jog will move your machine, changing the speed at which each jog will move your machine and all sorts of things. You can start, you can eat to enable the testing in Lightburn. If you wanted to test and focus in Lightburn, you have to go to uh, 
device settings, which is the wrench and screwdriver uh, icon at the top, device settings, click on that, and then you want to enable laser fire button, right? So now, if we were connected, we would be able to use this to set our power, just like G-Sender, and then fire the laser here, and uh, then to turn it back off, we'd click fire again, it would turn off. Uh, you can set how much power you want to test and then do that. You can set your origin point, you can jog it, focus it, all that fun stuff. And then when you're ready, you just click start right here. Obviously, make sure that you have a consistent start point in terms of your start from point here. So I would go from current position. I would like line up my job origin to whatever our machine job origin is, which is bottom left. I would set my origin and then I would start, it would start from the bottom or wherever you set the origin point and it would start engraving after you click start here. So that's how you actually use Lightburn. Uh, that's how you actually connect the long mill to Lightburn, actually use, uh, use it as a machine interface as well as a design software. So again, window, we want to enable console and move console move console it allows you to connect to the long mill controller and actually change the eprom settings manually by typing in dollar sign dollar sign will show all your current eprom settings anybody who's used ugs or cncgs will be familiar with this process but anybody who hasn't type in dollar sign dollar sign enter that will list out all your current eprom settings and then to change the eprom settings you would just individually type which EEPROM setting and equals what the new value is. So dollar sign 30 equals 255, enter. Dollar sign 31 equals zero, enter. Dollar sign 32 equals one, which enables laser mode, enter. And then you can click, you can enter dollar sign, dollar sign again to confirm that all your settings are saved. One more time, I'm just gonna repeat it. S value max always has to match dollar sign 30 when you are using the laser. So whether you're using this as a machine interface, Lightburn, or whether you're using G Center as a machine interface, it always has to match. So I'm gonna go ahead and save the G code. So I already have it saved, so I'm just gonna resave it. And you want it to be a .nc file. So if this doesn't occur as a .nc file, I will manually put .nc at the end of my file when saving. It will not run as a laser file. It, as a .nc file. Sometimes it automatically saves as a .nc, but just for safe measure, I like to always put .nc at the end of my file to make sure it saves as the proper file type. Um, it's personal preference. For Nicholas, what motivates you to use Lightburn versus G-Sender for the actual job run? Personal preference. Me, I like using G-Sender for my machine interface for the actual job run. I like using G-Sender. It's just more comprehensive. It's way easier. You have a better visualization, visualization, but some people are just very comfortable with Lightburn and they like the way it is. They like the cut of its jib. It's just easy. It's cool. It's nice. They don't want to switch software. It just saves them that extra second. So it's personal preference. What is the thickest piece of material that you've ever cut? The thickest material piece of material that I've ever cut is a quarter inch plywood. So I believe it took about 10 passes I lowered the power, I believe, and I actually did more passes because when I made the power 100%, dip switch setting five, and I lowered the speed so low, it would actually, uh, the wood itself would actually catch on fire before it finished burning. So what I actually did with a quarter inch piece of plywood is I, I think I did about 10 passes. I raised the speed a little bit and I just let it just keep going and I dropped it down. So for quarter inch, I divided a quarter inch by 10 passes and that's how much I put the Z drop down every time. So by the time it finished, it was dropped down a quarter inch and it cut through. So we save our file, it already exists, so we're gonna save it. Then we're gonna head over to G-Sender. Again, remember always to save it as a .nc file. Um, and then we're just gonna click load file. We're connected to our long mill up here. We click on load file, click on the file that we just saved, the .nc file. We open it up and we can see the general outline of everything looks good. You want to zero the, uh, you want to zero, uh, actually we're not going to zero anything right now. We're just going to make sure we're all focused first. So we're going to turn on our driver. 
If your driver doesn't turn on, that means you're, you have to enable your key, make sure your interlock is plugged in, uh, make sure it's getting power, and then if it still doesn't turn on with the power switch, press the reset button to get it to turn on, right? So our driver's on, we have our material here. So just for the future, if you see me turn on the laser, that's just me clicking on laser on in G Sender. Uh, we're gonna switch up the view so it's easier for you guys to see. But it, when you see me turn on the laser, it's just tur uh, clicking on uh, laser on in the G Sender uh, test um, corner of the screen right there. So spindle slash laser, uh, make sure to go to settings, laser spindle, make sure that's enabled and then go to the tab at the bottom right corner uh, and make sure that's enabled into laser mode. You can set the percentage lower um, and then you can make sure that you're focusing. So for me, my file stipulated a G2 lens, which I have installed and a dip switch setting of four. So I'm gonna make sure that dip switch setting four is enabled so that it matches the file so that every time I reference the file, I know that it's three millimeter birch, it was a G2 lens, I know the settings I used, and I know that it was dip switch four. So I made sure to do that. Now, I have my material here, and I'm just gonna generally line it up, right? We're gonna be starting from the bottom corner. Um, we're just going to be going to the bottom corner. And again, this is going to be my material that I'm actually focusing the laser on and I'm putting it on top of my material. I know it's about, um, so somebody's saying they lost a bit of sound. We're just going to do a quick sound check, quick sound check. So everything's good on our side. Hopefully the sound comes back for you, Dave. Sorry about that. But it might be hard to hear. We got the fan going from the light from the laser driver. I'm gonna to try to speak a little bit louder so that you guys can hear me, and hopefully it doesn't affect the audio at all. Um, so I'm gonna put this piece, the little waste material. I know it's six millimeters thick. I'm gonna put it on top of my material that I'm actually gonna be doing the lasering on. Right now, that's there. I need to set my height. So I'll show you guys in G Sender. I'm going to be setting my height using the lens focus finder for the G2. So I'll show you guys that. So you should get all four lens focus finders stock with the laser. Um, this is a double sided ruler essentially that you're measuring from your material to the bottom of your heat sink, right? So the black aluminum heat sink, you're measuring from the bottom of that to your material it has to be in the range of the top here, so top to bottom, or you can flip it and it has to be above this, right? So this is the lower end, this is the top end. So it, as long as it's touching this, touching this, or somewhere in between these two heights, you're in the focus uh, for the height. So when I place it here, as you can see, so I'm a bit above that. So what I wanna do is drop that down a little bit lower. So for now, I'm gonna change the Z move in G Sender down to one millimeter. So I have a bit more control and I'm gonna drop it down once. So now I'm just about in the range. So I'm above the short end and I'm below the top end. So I know I'm in a good range here in terms of focus, right? And that's why we use this focus finder here. So again, top of the, uh, the bottom of the aluminum to the top of your material. You use this as a ruler and whoops. And it should be in between. So it should either be touching this, you can turn it, it should be touching this, or it should be in between. So I have it somewhere in between there. So I know I'm at the right height. So now I'm gonna be clicking on to the laser test on button right here. And I have it set at 2% on dip switch four. So I'm going to, when I'm done focusing, I'm gonna press laser off. So just be aware of that, on, off. Don't let your laser run, turn it off when you're done focusing. So I'm gonna laser, turn laser on. And now we can see uh, that the beam has started. So right now it's unfocused. That's why it's not burning our material. And I'm just gonna keep turning until our 
laser beam gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we're starting to burn our material, which means we're getting close. I'm just going to stand up so I can see it a little better. So now we're getting close. I'm going to move it a little bit, my material, just so I can see better. And we are pretty damn focused. So it, the beam is very small. And I'm just going to play around with it till I feel very comfortable with where the beam is in terms of size. So now I got it down to about a pin. And I'm going to turn off my laser focus. I'm going to remove my material, my focusing material, right? You can see where all the burns were. You can see it's getting, it got smaller as I played around with it till I found the smallest point, right? And then I was comfortable with the focus, so I turned it off. And now the last thing I need to do before I know my machine is in focus is lower the Z by six millimeters, which was the thickness of that test material, right? I focus it to that. Now that I know it's focused, I can drop it down by six millimeters here just by changing the Z move to six and then clicking this down button once. Now I know I'm in focus. I'm going to zero all up here in the location section of G-Sender, zero all. And now I'm good to go. So you can do one more test to make sure that your positioning is right. But I think I'm pretty comfortable with my positioning in terms of my start point. And I think I'm ready to go. So dip switch four, everything is focused. My material is not marked up at all. You can see there, I use the test material to mark things up. Uh, you can see where all the little points were. And you can see how it just got smaller and smaller till I was comfortable with how small the burn was. We are in focus. So now I am going to click start job. I'm going to make sure, always make sure you have your glasses, your safety glasses on, and you're good to go. My driver is on, dip switch is set, everything is focused, job looks good, uh, everything is zeroed in terms of location and then I can click start job. So as you can see, it's gonna start engraving the text. You can change the order in which things engraved in Lightburn. So I'll quickly show you that. So in terms of what is actually going first, second, third, in terms of all this, you can change the order in which it happens, right? Just by dr clicking and dragging it. So if you want the image to go first, you can do that. Let's say you wanted to use the air assist to cut. You could change the cutting to the top or the bottom. You could then run the job without the air assist. As soon as it gets to the part where it's going to be cutting, as soon as it's finished all the fill, the images, the lines, and you know it's about to start cutting, you can pause the job in G-Sender, right? Just by clicking pause job. You can plug in your air assist and then you can continue the job and it'll start running so that your air assist was only on for that cutting, right? And that is just one of the benefits of changing the order in which your file is operating, right? So if you want cutting first, you can just turn the air assist on in the beginning, let it run, and then turn it off as soon as the cutting's done and your engraving will look good without the air assist and your cutting will be deeper with the air assist. So you can play with that, the order of things. So as you can see, the laser is gonna start marking. So this is a perfect time to just go ahead and say, uh, if you guys have any questions, I can answer for you. This is actually a pretty long job. So it's gonna take about, uh, I think about 20 minutes. We can go check the uh, G Sender estimator real quick. So there's about 16 minutes. So guys, if you have any questions for me, uh, at the end of this project, we will be ending the live stream. I wanna thank you guys all. 
Yes, Nicholas, good question. Pause will shut down the laser. It will pause the laser. It won't affect anything. It'll turn the laser off. Um, and then as soon as you press start again, the laser will start firing and it'll start firing from the exact position, the exact power setting uh, before you actually pause the job. There's a great function. Again, shouts out to Chris, our CTO, and uh, shouts out to the whole software engineering team for making such a great software. So let's we can go back uh, to this. So guys, if you have any questions for me, uh, we got about 15, 16 minutes uh, for this job to complete. I'll show you the finished product uh, and then I'll be ending the stream there. Uh, thank you very, very, very much for joining me. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, who works at CNC who uh, helped me and uh, who helped set up the stream and just help the product get out there. Uh, Bill, for us, we don't use um, any uh, smoke removal because we're currently in our shop and there's a garage connected to it. So we have um, a great kind of ventilation uh, in this back area. If you don't have great ventilation, uh, a four to eight inch inline fan with some ducting will work great in order to kind of get that smoke. And then you can duct it to a window, to a garage opening. You can just get that outside. Um, if you don't have good ventilation, you don't want to not have a um, an inline fan to kind of get that smoke out or just a regular fan to blow all the particulate and smoke in the direction of a vented uh, opening, right? So we are lucky enough to have a great big garage and a great big space that has great ventilation. So we're not too worried about smoke removal. Uh, Ethan, Rotary. So we actually will be this is this is an unofficial announcement so please don't hold me to it but i am very interested in designing a rotary axis for the laser just for the laser because it's a lot easier because you don't need a uh, very robust work holding you just need something that will rotate the material but if you would like to just order one right away you can always find one on amazon or by a trusted laser uh, supplier uh, and just make sure that the wires line up with the wires that we have for the long mill, right? So you're gonna be able to remove the Y-axis motor wires and add your rotary axis as long as the wires and the power setting of your motor matches the power setting and the wires of our motor that currently go into the long mill, right? So we use NEMA 23 motors and I believe they are uh, four pin motors so you can also do you can also do that but we are not liable if your if your rotary axis destroys your machine uh subtle plug i would love to start working on a rotary axis for the laser and hopefully get that out as soon as possible so you guys can start uh engraving glass and uh tumblers and mugs and uh aluminum bottles and things like that So Stephen, uh, Stefan, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, you have an inductive set and you would like to create a macro set uh, for the laser uh, as zero, zero, what would the macro look like? So essentially you would be measuring from um, the middle of your, well, I would, me I would measure the, your router mount length. I would measure your router mount length, half of that, is where your router is in terms of length, router mount, half of that is where your length. Uh, you could then measure the uh, steel uh, laser mount, right? So that's a measurement that you would add on to half of the uh, router mount length. You would then take the aluminum heat sink width and that would be half, that's where the laser sits. So it'd be half of the aluminum heat sink width or length. Um, it would be the length of the actual steel router mount. And then it would be half of the laser or the, the router mount length or width. And that would be uh, your travel in the, I believe the X direction. That's the difference in your X direction from the middle of the router for where your bit is to the middle of the, 
uh, aluminum for your, your, your laser. That's where the laser is. So that's in terms of one axis. And then you would have to measure out uh, the same thing in terms of your uh, laser. So if you took the entire mount, uh, the steel mount of your laser, and you measure that, cut that in half, and that's where your laser would be in the other axis, right? So you're just kind of plugging in. Uh, yeah, I, Stephen, I'm going to try my best. I, I know I, I, I should get that done as soon as possible. That's something we can work on. That's something we can even add to another stream where we show you how to switch, uh, add a macro to switch from your uh, laser to your um, to your your router and back and forth, and then eventually it'll be something that gets uh, added into G Sender as kind of a stock option. So so be patient. Uh, that, that's a great idea to add to the next live stream, and maybe we can do it live, and I can show you guys how uh, we can approach that and do that. Um, so yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Um, it's something we're gonna keep an eye out, and I'm gonna work very hard to kind of get that info out there for you. Uh, Bill, all for a rotary. Thank you very much. I am also all for a rotary. I know a lot of you guys would be too. It's a fun way to add even another layer to the laser, which is adding a layer to the long mill. And it's just a great little fun thing. So you guys can make all sorts of cool projects. Uh, I'm very passionate about getting that out. Uh, I'm going to try to do some development. I'm going to try to be as transparent as possible because a lot of you guys uh, or um, Chris and Andy, uh, our CEO and our CTO uh, and our founders of, of CNC Labs are very, 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 very uh, about transparency when it comes to lead times, development, uh, shipping, just transparency is number one. So the more live streams we do, remember every two weeks on Thursday, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the more I think I'll just show you guys what I'm working on in terms of rotaries, in terms of um, macros, in terms of all that. Uh, so just stay tuned. Oh, another feature I would like uh, to have a mount, mount that's magnetic so I can remove the laser easier. Chris is actually working on that, and he's just waiting for me to finish up a few things on my end so that I can help him add that. Uh, he's working on some other cool stuff in terms of magnetic mounting. Uh, Chris also, uh, Chris, Daniel, and the whole engineering team, they also designed uh, the, the, the dust shoe router mount uh, and all that fun stuff. So he has a lot of experience in terms of magnetic mounting, and he's just kind of waiting on me to finish up a few things on my end so that I can give him what he needs and help him, and we can work together to get out a magnetic mount for the laser. It's something I'm very passionate about. It's something I'm working on. You guys are probably sick of hearing how much I'm passionate about these things, but guys, uh, it takes a little bit to develop these things, and we're working hard to get them out. I know on my list, it would be uh, magnetic mount and rotary axis. Those are the two things I would love to get out as soon as possible um, to the customers. I know you guys have just been asking for these two things since we started shipping lasers, even before we started shipping lasers. So we do hear you. Bill, thank you very much. Uh, again, that just goes down to the, to the mindset that Chris and Andy has instilled in everybody who works here. Uh, they've definitely instilled with me when I went through my product development and it's just transparency because everybody is reasonable as long as they're not being lied to as there's not as long as they're not being kind of dragged around uh with like company corporate speak talk uh nobody likes that you know nobody nobody appreciates that people appreciate just being uh the honesty and if something messes up just sharing that as soon as possible i know when i started this i kind of had to shift my mindset to stop trying to make the process look good and all shiny and just give them the exact um what the truth is whether it's bad whether it's horrendous during this product development some of you guys might remember uh if you guys ordered early there were some horrendous delays that we dealt with right and they always andy and chris always told me just be honest and it, give out the information as soon as possible and most of you guys have just appreciated that so i'm going to continue to do that whether it's something we're developing in terms of magnetic mounts in terms of uh, the rotary axis i'm going to continue that ethos i'm going to continue that mindset i'm going to continue that into the future uh thank you very much for noticing that curtis thank you so much for your kind words um 
the the laser really is my baby so if you guys do send in a ticket it goes directly to me and, and i'm going to help you as best as i can um so i really appreciate the the, the notice on that uh, if you are engraving on a slightly curved surface should you focus uh on the high or the low you should actually try to focus somewhere in the middle obviously flattening uh the piece is obviously your best bet right using uh, double-sided tape to try to get as flat using hot glue to try to get it as flat as possible but if you can't um, try to find the middle not the high not the low try to find the middle and focus towards the middle that was to uh, uh, Ninter's question um, even I did oh wow Grant that's an awesome uh, project idea uh, that's so cool to hear Kelsey, again, you're the best. Uh, thank you for your kind words, Kelsey. Thanks for joining us in the stream and uh, providing some quick answers uh, to the customers uh, when I couldn't see them or get to them. Uh, you're, you, you are always much appreciated, Kelsey. Uh, you do a lot for the company, and uh, I'm sure uh, myself and all the rest of the customers appreciate what you do. G-Sender Edge states that it has better laser support. I've not tried it. What is your point of view on it? Uh, I'm not 100% uh, versed on G Sender Edge at this moment, but um, why don't we kind of table that and uh, I can answer that in the next live stream after I've done a little bit more research. I do apologize for not being able to give you a proper answer right now, but I don't want to just uh, give you a fluff answer about something I, I'm not 100% sure about. So, so let me get back to you on that, uh, Nicholas. Uh, Steven says you could personalize your lunch. Uh, yeah. So the laser is actually now cutting. Uh, so I'm going to make sure because obviously the laser is always a fire risk, but especially when you're cutting because you're dealing with higher power, right? So you want to keep an eye on it to make sure that no fires start and that you can kind of blow out a fire if it starts or even stop the project completely if it gets too dangerous, right? So we're currently cutting. Um, it's very powerful right now. We're working with a lot of power right now. So you always just want to keep an eye on that just to make sure that uh, there's no potential fires that are starting and that you're all staying safe. Uh, Stefan, I saw your comment. You could personalize your lunch. Guys, if you guys are bored, I would love to see you guys engrave some uh, marshmallows. So play with some settings, engrave some marshmallows. Uh, and share them with the CNC Instagram, the CNC Facebook team. Our marketing team would love that. Uh, we'll repost it. Um, that 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 would actually be hilarious. It's something we kind of joke about internally. Uh, grab a mush, uh, grab a marshmallow, and engrave the marshmallow, and then like make a s'more out of it. I think that would be so fun. I think that would be kind of funny. So uh, yeah, my <laughs> my baloney has a first name. <laughs> Grant and Stefan, you guys are cracking me up. Grant, thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Grant has accepted the challenge to engrave some marshmallows. Um, send in the pictures on Instagram. Tag us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, email them to us, however you guys want to get them to us. Uh, we, I would love to get that one reposted on the on the CNC Instagram and stuff because I just think that's so funny. Uh, find the coolest thing that you can engrave on a marshmallow. You're going to have to dial in the settings for sure because the marshmallow is going to want to burn. Uh, but I think you can dial them in to a point where it will give a very cool engraving effect. So shout out Grant, uh, shout out anybody else who tries it and sends uh, their pictures in. I think that will be fun and awesome to do. So Nicholas asks if uh, it, it, if it would take fire, what would you use? Uh, so you could use a water sprayer. We do recommend that every shop has a uh, fire extinguisher so that you could properly put out a proper fire. If it's just a small fire, we I recommend pausing the job and then just trying to blow it out without moving your material. If there's a hope that it could continue uh, running, then I would suggest that you kind of just pause your file. It's happened to me a few times where a small fire starts when I'm cutting and using high power. I'll just pause my job. I'll uh, give the, the fire a little blow, get it, get, get, get it down, and I'll resume my job. And most of the time, it doesn't start again. But if it does, then I know I have to pause my job or I have to cancel my job and eventually lower the settings or use a different piece of wood, right? Because different grains are going to have different outputs, uh, are going to have different uh, flammability levels or flammable levels. Uh, so it's kind of hit or miss. But 
in every shop, you should have a fire extinguisher, a fire suppression system, something like that, a professional, uh, something that you can buy from your local hardware shop, a Canadian, a Canadian tire, anything like that. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the question. So let's take a look at our finished material. So let me use this camera. It's going to be better. So as you can see here, you can see that the image engraved. You can see the shading, different power levels. You can see what the engraving is going to look like. We weren't able to cut all the way through. Um, that's because we used dip switch setting four, right? So if we were using dip switch setting five, uh, this uh, would definitely cut out all the way. You could see it didn't make it to the back. But if we we're using dip switch level five, which I do recommend if you are going to be cutting, use the air assist and dip switch level five. Uh, that's what it's going to be. Uh, getting through the cut so but even that is useful information right i know dip switch level four at four passes at 100 percent will not cut out three millimeter birch right so again even a failed uh test file is still going to provide you with great information on what to do next right so for my next one i would definitely do dip switch level five and maybe use an air assist and i would note with text in here that I used in air assist, right? So now I can compare air assist at dip switch four or dip switch five versus no air assist at dip switch four, right? So that's why I recommend using this. Even if you had a, if you have a problem with your laser, um, but it's still firing, I would suggest you run one of these and just send me a picture. Cause then even I can look at it and kind of get an idea. Um, Eric, it was four passes. But again, it was dip switch level four, which uh, is hard to cut with, right? Because even dip switch level four is 80% of what your max power is. So you can always raise it to dip switch level five or lower the speed, right? I could have went from 2.2 millimeters per second to 2.0 or 2 millimeters per second. I could have went as low as 2.0 or 1.5 millimeters per second. I could have took it as low as possible. But then again, the lower you go, you might start to see the wood become flammable. You're going to want to find that sweet spot. But definitely, if I was to run this job again, I would change the text in the file to dip switch level five, and I would change it to air assist, right? Uh, and then I would add the air assist and do that. So do you use uh, apply transfer paper on top of the material to protect from discoloration? I would recommend like masking tape if you're cutting and you want to protect the material. Just note that it will have to cut through the masking tape. Uh, it should in the first pass, but uh, I would use masking tape. Uh, the laser, when it cuts different materials, you want to make sure that you know exactly what you're cutting with the laser, right? Um, we're going to be ending off the stream soon, so I'm just going to switch the view. And uh, I'm going to answer any last questions you have. So, Nicholas, you want to be you want to know exactly what's in what you're lasering, right? Because certain materials, when a laser hits them, is going to produce toxic smoke and particulate, right? So we have a list uh, in our safety manual. We have it in our resources. We have it on our product page. Certain materials you cannot cut or engrave with a laser like PVC. If you try to engrave PVC with a laser, you're going to produce uh, chlorine gas, essentially, which will be toxic, and I'm pretty sure it's against the Geneva Code. So please, 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 you need to know exactly what you're engraving. Uh, you could check out the safety manual in our resource section. You check out the product page for a general list of materials you cannot and materials you can engrave. You can check out the resource section in the safety section. You can check out that list, but you want to do your research on what exactly you're engraving. So masking tape is pretty safe uh, in terms of using with a laser. Uh, you can also just check out different forums online to see what people use uh, to get certain results. Uh, again, we're a big community, but there's an even bigger community out there of people who just love making stuff. So if we don't know the answer, our community doesn't know the answer, you can always branch out in terms of uh, specifics, like if transfer paper would be good. I just don't know personally. I would use masking tape if I was, if I was cutting something and I wanted to protect the, uh, the wood itself from discoloring, I would use masking tape. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on the first Laser Beam live show. Uh, thank you.
to everybody at the company here at CNC Labs who helped make this a reality, who helped get products out from us to you. Thank you, the customer who helps us uh, kind of push this company forward with your ongoing and enormous support. Thank you to everybody who works here. You guys are great. Thank you to the customers. You guys are great. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, maybe I'll say thank you one more time, but uh, thank you. Uh, we'll catch you in two weeks, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let me get a date for you really quick. Uh, it The next live stream will be Thursday, September the 15th, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will put out the announcements when the dates come close. We'll let you know what we're working on that live stream. So if you're interested, you can jump in and we could do this again another time. Uh, thank you guys all. Uh, let me just double check for last questions. Any information regarding settings for Australian wood, such as Jerome or Iron Park? Um, Jill's. I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, the best thing for you to do is just to take a generic setting. Like you could even take the settings that I use for the birch and just try it out. If it's not dark enough, raise the power or lower the speed. If it's too dark, uh, lower the power or raise the speed. Uh, you, you could use the file. You can download the file and you could just start playing with it. Um, because every piece of wood is going to react different. Every type of wood is going to react different, and the different settings are going to change how you react. So the best thing you can do is download the file that we just put. It's in the link. It's in the description in the resource section. It's a laser beam, or it's a laser test light burn file uh, that we just uh, that we just engraved and, and tried to cut on the stream. Uh, download that. Uh, label it Australian uh, wood or Jura or iron bark. Label it whatever you're testing play with the settings, try something out of the blue, L like look how it sees. If you like it, uh, then now you have a reference for it for next time. And if you don't like it, change up the settings, try something else. And when you find something you like, you'll have the perfect reference using this file. So guys, thank you for joining us. We're going to head out. I hope you guys all have a good night or a good afternoon, wherever you guys are watching from. Uh, you guys are great once again. Uh, so yeah, we're going to end the broadcast and uh, we'll catch you guys later. Bye.